Hello, <laughs> hello, folks. This is uh, Richard Hall from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa, and this is a look at the night sky. And I've got, of course, uh, Kay with me. Say hello, Kay. Hello, everyone. And I've got this other weird guy with me as well. I yeah, think, the I strange, think, strange musician it, called Keith Austin. It's Keith Austin. <laughs> <laughs> there uh -huh. we. There, for those of you, you can see them there, and uh, I'm, I'm the intelligent, handsome one with uh, playing the bass guitar. Well, <laughs> this is not a propaganda show. <laughs> okay, I'd also like always like to thank Dan Broughton, who uh, from Wire Web Design, who uh, gives uh, our program support and so on. So, what we're going to talk about, of course, is the night sky and uh, for those of you watching on tv you've just seen the uh southern night sky come up and um, we're looking towards the south and this time of the year as the evening goes on the southern cross is getting its highest point in the sky but whenever we look at the night sky for the average person it's all right it's not so nice interesting things like stars and that but there's no sort of context of what it's all about in other words we can't see the forest for the trees. I think that's the yes. uh, term, isn't it? So, f for example, um, let's go in a little bit further. For, before I go on, I should point out that we are, of course, in, in autumn. And looking towards the west, we've got Orion, which is setting, which is our... Orion is the sign of summer. So when Orion's in the sky, summer's on. But rising up in the east, of course, oh, we've got the scorpion. And the scorpion for us is the sign of winter. Right? So this is just over the ch changeover period. And by midwinter, the scorpions are going to be coming directly overhead in the early evening. Anyway, here's a nice, uh, for those of you watching this on TV, there's a nice photograph that's just come up of uh, a forest. And in case you don't know it, don't recognise it, it's actually the Amazon. Right? And that's what I was talking about when we were talking about you can't see the trees, uh, can't see the forest for the trees. Right? So imagine standing in the Amazon, that's what you can see. But you've got no idea of the scale of, the, of, of it. it. That's right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take a little bow out a little bit. There we are. Boom. And even in this, this wonderful photograph here where the Amazon from a distance fills the sky, that's not it. <laughs> It's bigger than that as well, all right? And this really does apply also to the to the universe. So taking it further back, of course, we know the Amazon is a large part in the southern region of uh, the lower part of the... Um, the Americas. The Americas, yeah. And, but it's, it is very much like when we look at the sky. There's all these things up there, and we see these stars and things like that, but we've got no idea of how far away they are or how they fit into the story. So what we thought we'd do today is actually take you through a, a good part of the, the universe, all right, and take it at what we can see out there and how it fits into that picture. Yeah. And for those of you watching this on TV, so this beautiful photograph, and I think it's absolutely beautiful, of the place where we live in New Zealand, come up taken from space. Doesn't it look great? And you can see where the main populations are and that sort of thing. Anyway, New Zealand, of course, is part of um, planet Earth. And for those of you who can see Aussie there, all right? Uh, sitting on the edge of there and you can see the moon in the distance as well and our planet in turn orbits a star which we call the sun and this is the problem because in the ancient world when we look, talk about stars and planets the original meaning of the word star of course is just a, a bright little shiny thing in the night sky and a planet was a wandering star because there's these there's these uh, stars in the sky that appear to wander around today we know they're not stars. They wander amongst yeah. the, the other fixed stars. Yeah, that's right, but that's what they, they just look like they're moving around. So that's what planet means, a wandering star. But of course now, of course, the word planet is what it really is. It's actually a world orbiting a star. Mm. And of course, stars are gigantic objects. And this is what we have to get into mind. Um, uh, looking at these things on the TV, people can see the scale of the different sizes b between the, st the sun and the planets. The distances are not correct. Right? We just wouldn't be able to fit it on there. But as you can see, our Earth is a little tiny speck. You could fit over a million Earths inside the sun. And this is a difference between a star and a planet. Essentially, whether we like it or not, the planets are just a debris left behind from the formation of a star. But a star has got so much mass 
that its central tension pressure becomes so high that thermonuclear reactions are re released. So in other words, there's a thermonuclear, thermonuclear bomb going off, but on a fast scale. And that's the energy coming out of the sun, which bathes those planets, OK? Yeah, the planets only shine in our sky. Uh, by reflected light from the sun. Absolutely. The sun itself is uh, self-luminous. Yeah. It's, the, it's the source of all the light and that's it. in our solar system. And that's it. When we look at the stars and planets in the sky, exactly the same thing. As when we look at the, what is a star, we're looking at a distant sun. Yes. But the planets that we can see all belong to our star. They're the, like the Earth orbiting around the sun. Planets around other stars are too far away and too faint to be seen with the eye. Okay, so that's the way in which that works. Okay, so, but there's looking at the stars at night, what we don't realize is that, of course, a bit, bit like the planets. When we looked at the planets just now, you could see like you've got Jupiter, right? You could fit all the planets, other planets inside Jupiter just about, okay? There, there's, there's rocky planets like the Earth, gas giants, ice giants, they enormous variety of different types of worlds orbiting around the sun. Same applies to the stars. They're not all just like our sun. There's got, we've got this enormous variety of different stars in size, in colour, and so on, all right? And so when we look at a star, if it appears bright, it doesn't mean it's bright because it's close, it's close to us. It might be that it's actually physically bright, but a long way away, all right? But what I will tell you is that straight away, is the bigger and brighter a star is, the rarer it is, all right? So big bright stars are a lot brighter than our sun are extremely rare, but because they are so bright, they can often dominate our sky because they shine out over vast distances where the common or garden variety of star wouldn't, all right? So something to, to bear in mind. So let's go and have a closer look uh, around that little region around the Southern Cross. And you too, you can butt in any time you like as we go along. Uh, here we can see the Southern Cross and, uh, of course, the two famous stars that follow it around are the two pointer stars, all right? And the brightest of those is Alpha Centauri. And, of course, Alpha Centauri is the nearest star beyond the solar system, all right? Uh, and so for those of you, it's 4.3 light years away. Of course, now, a light year is the distance light travels in a year, all right? Um, if you could travel at the speed of light, the time it takes you to blink your eye, you could travel right around the planet and round back again. So a light year is a great distance. So, so some people do get confused about this. They hear the word year and they think, oh, it's a measure of time. But it isn't. No. It's a measure of distance. One light year is, what, 100 trillion kilometres. So Alpha Centauri, which we're looking at at the moment, that's 4.2... 4.3, yeah. Yeah, 100 trillion kilometers That's right, yeah. from Earth. And it's and as you said, it's the closest star to our sun. And this is why um, Alpha Centauri features so prominently in uh, science fiction, um, uh, because uh, because of its proximity to, uh, to the sun. Mm. In science fiction stories, it's usually the first star to be colonized by oh. humanity. It was always the one that I was most fascinated with because it is the closest star, all right? And, um, yeah. But to, to get an angle on these stars, we have to go in a little bit closer and have a look. So Alpha Centauri is 4.3 light years away. And we to mention time just now because light takes time to get there. So when we say Alpha Centauri is four light years away, it means the light from that star has taken four years to get here. And that light is carrying information. So we see that we see Alpha Centauri as it was four years ago. Yeah. And the further we look into space, the further back was in time we're looking. So as I always say to people, we don't see the universe as it is. We see it as it was. Okay? So that's Alpha Centauri. Now, even in a relative uh, small telescope an astronomical telescope one of the things you'll discover is you look and you don't see one star you see two because unlike our solar system which has got only one star the sun the alpha centauri system has got two suns all right and whereas a few years ago we didn't have the technology to discover planets around other stars 
now we're discovering thousands of them. It's fairly certain that just about every star is going to be accompanied by planets. And that for me is a very exciting oh. time. This is a very exciting time in astronomy because uh, we're just discovering so many new planets around other stars. Yeah. You know, our, our methods of detecting these things are getting better and better. Mm. Well, the thing is, there's so many worlds out there now that just about anything we imagine, even in science fiction, probably does <laughs> exist out there somewhere. Yes. OK, so we've got Alpha Centauri, a double planet, and we have discovered planets of Alpha Centauri. And uh, for those of watching this on TV, you can see a, a representation of a sunset on a planet at Alpha Centauri which has got two suns, so you have a double sunset as one sun sets after the other, OK? Yes. And both of those suns, incidentally, are very similar to our own sun. OK, that's the Alpha Centauri system. But the other pointer star next to it, Agena, its distance is 392 light years. All right. So it's around about 10 times further away than Alpha is. And this immediately tells you, to, for that to be so, this must be a very luminous star, which of course it is, OK? Mm. But also remember what we're saying. We're seeing Agena, when we look at it, as it was nearly 400 years ago. In turn, if there was someone on a planet going around Agena and they had a big telescope and they were looking down here at Earth, they wouldn't see you and I. They would be seeing the Earth as it was 400 years ago. Yes. So what were we doing 400 years ago, Kay? Not, I don't mean you and me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, as a musician, I like to think of the classical composers. I mean, that was the time of yeah. uh, Mozart and Scarlatti and so... The Tudors. The Tudors, you know, yeah. the Tudor um, monarchs of, of England. Mm, yeah. Um, beings on a Jenna, um, or orbiting a planet, um, on a planet orbiting a Jenna, they, uh, with a super telescope, they will be seeing Mozart. <laughs> composing his yeah. operas. Yeah, and they could they could watch what Henry VIII was up to and things. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah but, that, but that, I say this is the interesting thing is, you know, that if we find a planet, we get technology to look at the planet around Alpha Centauri in detail, we're not going to yes. see it as it was, we're going to see it as it was. Yes. And that, of course, applies to aliens who are out there, yes. are looking down here. All right? yes. So what they're going to think of us as they're watching Henry VIII? Yeah. So, who knows? <laughs> okay, so that, that's a Gina. All right? Now, ne next to as you, the... The two pointer stars put point to the Southern Cross. And next to the Southern Cross is a dark patch in the sky called the coal sack. All right? And it is literally dark. On the photograph we've got on TV at the moment, you can see some stars. And they're, four, they're stars that are closer to us than the coal sack. But those stars are too faint to be seen with the unaided eye. And when you go out at night, you've got this bright region of the Milky Way, and then next to the Southern Cross, you've got this black spot. It's, right? it's, like, a, it's like a deep velvet black yeah. spot yeah. in the sky. Well, it's not that there's no stars there, because in the stars that we tend to think of the vacuum of space, there's dust and gas laying between the stars. And in some regions, particularly along the Milky Way, it collects into vast dark clouds, which are so dense and so on, they simply blot out the light of more distant stars. Yes. And this material, which we can see running all the way along the Milky Way, is the raw material from which new stars and solar systems are formed. Because over time, the black cloud that we can see, the coal sack, will gradually contract. And when it does so, it will condense into stars. I say stars because stars are never born singularly. So they, perhaps half a billion years from now, what is now the coal sack is going to be a new star. New star brand, cluster. Brand new star with brand new planets around. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And as, as Kay was just saying, now the coal sack uh, is about the same distance away as a Gino. It's about 400 light years away. All right. But there is a... All stars are not, are not born singularly, they're always born in clusters. And we don't have to go farther than the Southern Cross to see a, a beautiful cluster, all right? Uh, now, when stars are formed, all right, the first stars to be formed are the giant stars. Giant stars don't live very long. The bigger a star, the shorter its life, right? 
and the giant stars as they switch on they pour out vast amounts of uv and that illuminates the surrounding cloud that they've just condensed out of and there's a beautiful one near the southern cross so to the right called the eta carinae nebula all right now that's 9,000 light years away, so we're seeing it as it was 9,000 years ago. And near the centre of that uh, is this huge clusters of stars that are being formed. It's absolutely magnificent seen in a large telescope. So this is the birth ground of a new star cluster. And okay, so what we're looking at there is um, a UV fluorescence effect. Mm. It's rather like um, uh, black light, you know, the black lights you see in discos and that sort of thing. Mm. They don't shine by their own light, but they illuminate. They, mm. they, well, they that other colours. They illuminate other things, but also the, yes. with the very high UVs at the centre, also it ionises the gas, so the gas then gives off its own light yes and the color of that right, tells us what the gas is what it's made of so the pinks and always come to make sure it's like a neon light isn't it that's right yeah mm. and for those who watch it i've brought up a, 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 de a demonstration of the star that's sent sitting at the center there all right and this star is well over a million times brighter than the sun okay and it is a binary system <laughs> so, a million times brighter <laughs> yes right yeah more than that but it won't it will only last for you know a few tens of thousands of years and it will be gone okay yeah so what we'll end up with is a cluster and this is again a photograph going deeper into there you can see a cluster forming there all right a cluster of stars and eventually the gas and dust will be blown away and we end up and i was saying earlier on next to the southern cross one of the stars in the southern cross is a cluster and to the unaided eye it just looks like a i know you with a pair of binoculars you can see there's something there uh now the, the it's a dual box cluster it's just over six thousand light years away but it's absolutely brilliant seen in the in a telescope and the reason why it's called a jewel box you'll see when i bring this yes. photograph up it's magnificent and the reason for that is we've got big bright stars of different colors we've got this beautiful big orange red star and then we've got blue stars and so on and you can still see a haze around them and that's the remains of the gas and dust but in addition to those big bright stars there there's lots of other ones i think there's about several hundred of st hundred stars in that then over time there's that cluster orbits around the galaxy right the cluster will gradually disintegrate and the stars will then carry on apart from where their binary systems and so on in their own path so when our sun was born four and a half billion years ago it would have had lots of brothers and sisters it was siblings yes. yeah so they're out there somewhere and indeed in nasa they've actually been trying to hunt down some of our brothers and sisters to ask have they ever actually found they them? think they have found one and the only way we can say it's that it's travels in the same but it's always got a composition that's virtually identical to that other yes. sun and that's the clue all right chemical composition that's right yeah yes. So we think we found one, and it's travelling on a same sort of similar path. So they're hunting for those out there. So those stars, when we can find them, particularly ones about the same size as the Earth, if they've got planets, they're going to have the same similar sort of age. So maybe they've evolved stuff on there, you know, same way as ours. So in other words, around those other suns, there could be other Earths. Absolutely, yeah. It's food for thought. <laughs> Yes, indeed it is, yeah. So that's the jewel box cluster. And notice at the moment, folks, we're not looking far beyond the Southern Cross. All of these beautiful things that we can see. Now, as you look along the Milky Way, with a pair of binoculars particularly, you will pick up lots of star clusters. Because the, the, the Milky Way is the plane of our galaxies where all that dust and gas is, and it's where new stars are forming. All right? So that's what we're going to have a look at. The Milky Way itself, well, what is the Milky Way? Well, the Milky Way is simply vast amount numbers of stars which are so far away that they cannot be seen individually. So we're seeing the combined light of thousands and thousands of stars. Yes. And you're, as you look along the Milky Way, suddenly you'll see these dark patches similar to the coal sack. That's the, again, not there's no stars there. It's a, that dark gas and dust lays along the plane of the Milky Way. The coalescence of mm. dust and yeah. that sort of thing. 
The Milky Way has, um, you'll probably know more about this than I do, Richard, but it has all sorts of different uh, mythological um, uh, essences, as it were, in, in, different, in different societies. Um, and, you know, in Greek it was the um, uh, milk from the goddess Hera. Um, you mean it's not? <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the Bushmen of South Africa call it the backbone. Yeah. Uh, it's like this big spine, yeah. and they, they say it's holding the whole yeah. the whole. Cosmos. Well, people are always trying to work out what are they actually looking at up there, you know what I mean? And it's only in, in recent times, in our generations really, that you know we've got the technology to work out what the stars are. And this is really what we're showing people now. We're yes. breaking it down to what you're actually looking at. I think the Maori way of looking at it is probably closer. So it's basically Aramatua, the highway of the ancients. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's probably closest because you, they're a navigating group. Yeah. So they were using it for navigation across the biggest ocean in and the world. And what do you, you use the bright stars? Like most of the bright stars in our sky lay along the Milky Way. It's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and incidentally, for those of you watching this on TV, that photograph you can see, that's actually taken from uh, a, a road on in the wire wrapper, all right? There's not many people around the world get sights like that when they're driving home, you know. They're getting better. Yeah, with the dark sky. Yeah, they, are, got, they are getting so. better because some of the lights are being turned into LEDs which are compatible with looking mm. at the night sky. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And that's, that's, what, that's what Dark Sky Reserve is all about. It's not using, not having lights, it's having the correct lighting, all right? That's the way in which it works. But I want again to remind you, you look up there at that night sky and every one of those little dots is a different sun and orbiting around them are worlds. As I said earlier, just about everything we can imagine must be out there somewhere. And as our technology evolves, gradually we're being able to find out more and more about these things. Now, our galaxy is a spiral galaxy. We don't know this because we can't actually see it, because it's like being in the woods, we can't see the forest. Like looking at that picture of the, the Amazon, right? We're in the, in the inside. But we are able to map it out with radio telescopes, which can pass through the trees, as it were. And we know that our galaxy is a big spiral galaxy, all right? And looking a bit like this one I've got at the moment. So let's map out what we, we do know about it, okay? Well, it's what we call a barred spiral galaxy. And most of the stars are concentrated in there. You can see where the sun is there. I'm at about 26,000 light years from the centre. So that circle at the bottom. Yes. Is that showing where approximately where our sun is. the sun's at the center the it's circles as you can see the circle is showing you every star that you can see with the unaided eye is in that circle so as you can see we don't see much of the milky way do we all right the rest of it's plotted out the two bright regions you can see of the milky way uh, of the spiral arms shown up and below are actually the milky way that you can see so as you can see with the unaided eye it's a bit like in that picture we started off with the forest. Yes. We ain't seeing much of our Milky Way galaxy, yes. okay? Okay, so we that's where we are just, there. Just, just a few <laughs> nearby stars. But all the rest of the stars, uh, they're so distant that all we, all we see naked eye from Earth is just this band, well, this ghostly band. Well, either, either, either they're either too they faint to be seen or they're blotted out by the Milky Way and we can only see the closer regions and so on. Yeah. You have to have some yeah. aid. Yeah. Any further. All right. Now, in the, rising up now in our evening sky, and then we'll come overhead in the winter, is the brightest region of Milky Way. And near the center there, we're looking actually towards galactic center, which is 26,000 light years away. Yeah. And located out there is a gigantic black hole. So, so our galaxy, in a sense, its heart is a is black. It's that's true of most galaxies, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's what holds them together. And there's even some belief that they're actually the nucleus from which the galaxies actually form because mm. matter was spiralling around them in the first place. Yeah, so we've got this titanic black hole sitting at the centre there, and its mass is four million times that of the sun. So, in other words, 
at least four million tons have fallen down this hole to create it. And it's got a diameter of 44 million kilometers, all right? Yeah, so there you are. That's what we're looking towards the center there. But of course, whenever we look at the, the Milky Way galaxy, we, we were looking at the, as it were, edge on. If we could turn it around and look at the side, yes. we find it as a great flattened that's system. Beautiful, uh, it would be a beautiful sight from mm. way out in yeah. the galactic. And that's what it would be looking like if you could see it edge on. But the point is, that's not all a galaxy is. Surrounding it in a big spherical thing is what we call the halo. halo. And the halo consists of millions of stars, but are too faint individually to be seen. But the, the interesting thing is they're all ancient stars. They're stars that have been left over from the formation of our solar system. And orbiting around, also we find these beautiful clusters of stars, which we call globular star clusters, all right? Yes. And they, they are, these globulars are in the halo. That's right, that yeah, is. yeah. And, and, uh, we, we can have a look at these in more detail later on, but there's a beautiful one just above the Southern Cross called Omega Centauri, and it is absolutely amazing, all right? Its distance is 17,000 light years, and it contains 10 million stars, and they're all more than 10, million year, 10 billion years old. So this, this is a relic left over from the formation of the solar system. Anyway... Uh, I was going to go on and talk about the local group, but we'll have to pick up that later on. So I'm going to whiz forward all right, and just look at what we're looking at at the moment. And we can have a look at all that stuff later on. But just to point out that this Saturday, if you want to come along to Stonehenge, uh, Kay is going to be giving a talk on the mysterious world of Enceladus. And she's going to take you out to an alien world. So we've got that coming up. Uh, Stonehenge is open from... Uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Wednesday to Sunday, yeah. And the other thing we've got, we're doing is Star Trek. So if you want to come out and discover the stars, you have to give Kay a call and she'll sort out a Star Trek for you, okay? And finally, we've got the winter solstice coming up, the middle of winter, June 22nd, and we'll better see those galaxies. Anyway, folks, I'm going to have to shut up now because <laughs> we've run out of time. So, Kay, thank you for helping, and Keith. And... Yes. Um, Always a pleasure, Richard. And we, we will catch up again soon. Thank you, folks. Yes. Catch you later. Bye.